أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم وكل جاء الحق وزاك الباطل إن الباطل كان زهوكا ونزل من القرآن ما هو الشفاء ورحمة للمؤمنين ولا إذ الظالمين إلا خسارة بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب الشوه لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل الأقدة من لساني يفكه كولي I welcome all of you with Islamic greetings. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May peace, blessings and mercy of Almighty Allah be on all of you. The topic of this afternoon's talk is Islam and secularism. Tolerance or intolerance? Religion and secularism, they are poles apart. Difference of chalk and cheese, they are poles apart. Religion, according to the Oxford Dictionary, means a belief in a superhuman controlling power, a personal god or gods that deserve worship and obedience. Secularism, according to the Oxford Dictionary means concerning with the affairs of the world. It also means something which is not sacred, something which is not religious. And it also means non-monastic. Islam comes from the root word salam, meaning peace. It also means submitting your will to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to God Almighty. In short, Islam means peace acquired by submitting your will to God Almighty. And the Holy Quran mentions in Surah Al-Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 19, in the deena in the Allah al-Islam, the only religion acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. Islam is not a mere religion. It is a complete way of life. It's a complete code of conduct. And it deals with both. Spiritual, that is the soul, as well as physical, that is the body. It's a dual combination of both. The spiritual aspect and the physical aspect. Most of the major religions, whether it be Hinduism, Buddhism, Christianism, especially the Catholic Church, most of the major religions, they say that if you have to come closer to God Almighty, you have to renounce the world. You have to lead a life of celibacy, of monasticism. That means, Your parents, because they did not renounce the world, you came into existence in this world. You were born because your parents did not renounce the world. Indirectly insinuating that because your parents, they were not religious, that's the reason that you were born. If suppose, every human being agrees that according to these religions, that he wants to come closer to God Almighty. And he decides, and she decides, that they should renounce the world. Then within a span of 100 to 150 years, human beings will cease to exist on the face of the earth. They will cease to exist. Our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, there is no monasticism in Islam. And according to Sayy al-Bukhari, according to Sayy al-Bukhari, volume 7, in the book of Miqah, chapter number 3, hadith number 4, our beloved Prophet said, that, O oh, young people, whoever has the means to get married, should get married. For it will help him to lower his gaze and guard his modesty. And according to Anas, may Allah be pleased with him, he said, that the Prophet said, 
that anyone who marries, he completes half his being. Once during a question answer time, there was a person who asked me the question. That doesn't mean that if I marry twice, I complete my full deen. <laughs> what did the Prophet mean when he said that if you marry, you complete half your deen? It meant that marriage protects you from promiscuity, from fornication, from homosexuality, which are half the evil of the society. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to become a husband or a wife. Only if you marry, do you have an opportunity to become a father or a mother, which are important duties in Islam. So irrespective, whether you marry once or twice, yet you only complete half your deen. Islam, as I mentioned, it has a dual role. It serves, it is, has a spiritual role and a physical role. It serves the body as well as the spirit, the soul. There are people who say that I have done enough of dunya dari. Now I want to go towards deen. That means they have done enough of worldly affairs. Now they want to go towards deen, towards Islam. These people fail to realize that dunya is part of deen. Worldly affairs is a part of Islam. You cannot be a good Muslim unless you follow even the worldly affairs. To be a good Muslim, you have to do dunya dari. You have to take part in the worldly affairs. Without taking part in worldly affairs, you cannot be a good Muslim. But the Holy Quran at the same time says in Surah Nisa, Chapter 4, verse number 171. Do not go to extremes in your deen, in your way of life. That means, don't do too much of worldly affairs and neglect the other part of deen. There has to be a striking balance between the two. Therefore I say that Islam is the most secular religion. As I mentioned earlier, according to Oxford Dictionary, Secularism means something which is not monastic and Islam prohibits monasticism. Secularism means something concerned with the affairs of this world. And Islam says that if you want to be a good Muslim, you should be concerned with the worldly affairs. So in this sense, Islam is the most secular religion. There are people who have different definitions of secularism. When I say Islam is secular, it means that we should live in harmony with the people. Living in harmony does not mean that you have to be a hypocrite. There are some people who say that even Ram is God and even Rahman is Allah. Even Ram is Allah, even Rahman is Allah. Especially the politician. They scratch the back of the non-Muslim to please them. And some people who say that Jesus peace be upon him, even he is God and even Allah is God. This I do not say is secularism, I call it as hypocrisy. Living in harmony means that suppose there is a teacher. Suppose there are two teachers. One teacher says that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. And the other teacher says that 2 plus 2 is equal to 5. Living in harmony does not mean that you have to agree with both the teachers. You don't have to agree with falsehood. You have to say that I agree with the first teacher that 2 plus 2 is equal to 4. I do not agree with the second teacher 2 plus 2 is equal to 5, but I will not fight with him. I will only convey the message of truth, but I will not fight with him. I will live in harmony with him. This is the meaning of secularism. There are some Muslims who say that the Holy Quran says Lakum dinukum deen. That means to use your way to me is mine. Therefore, you need not talk about Islam to the non-Muslim. Islam is very secular. They are quoting the Holy Quran out of context. What they are quoting is the verse of Surah Al-Kafirun, chapter 109, verse number 6. 
which they are faith. Lakum dinukum baliyadin. That to use your way to me is mine. But if you have to quote this verse, it is compulsory that you also quote the first five verses of the surah. Which says, قُلْ يَا أَيُّهَا الْكَافِرُونَ لَا أَعْبُدُوا مَا تَعْبُدُونَ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَابُدْ وَلَا أَنَا عَابِدٌ مَا عَابَدْتُمْ وَلَا أَنْتُمْ عَابِدُونَ مَا عَابُدْ لَكُمْ دِينُكُمْ بَلْيَدِينَ Which means, say to those who reject faith. The question of rejecting the faith only arises if you present the truth to them. So only after you present the truth of Islam to them, does the question of rejection arise. So the Holy Quran says, that say to those who reject faith, I worship not what you worship, nor will you worship that which I worship. I will not be worshipping that which you want me to worship, nor will you worship what I worship. To you is your way and to me is mine. Only after you proclaim the first five verses do you have the right to say the sixth verse of Surah Al-Kafirun. There are other Muslims, mainly the politicians, who say that the Holy Quran says, La ikraha fi deen. There is no compulsion religion. Therefore, you need not talk about Islam. Let him follow his way of life and we have to be bothered about our way of life. Again, they are quoting out of context. They are quoting a verse of the Holy Quran from Surah Al-Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 256, which does say, like deen, that there is no compulsion in religion, but they have to complete the verse. It further says that truth stands out clear from error. Anyone who rejects the evil and believes in Allah, he has held the strong hand of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala which never breaks. And anyone who rejects faith and believes in the evil one, he will take you from light to darkness. And anyone who rejects evil and believes in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he will take you from darkness unto light. You have to complete the verse. I do agree there is no compulsion religion, but truth stands out clear from error. You have to present the truth to them, then you cannot force them. Forcing Islam at the point of the sword, it is useless. The Holy Quran also says in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 108, it says that revile not those who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will revile Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Quran says that you should not abuse those people who worship God besides Allah. Lest in their ignorance, they will abuse Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Hujurat, chapter number 49, verse number 13, it says, يَا أَيُّهَا النَّاسُ إِنَّا خَلَقْنَاكُمْ مِنْ ذَكْرٍ وَأُنْسَى وَجَعَلْنَاكُمْ شَوْبًا وَقَبَائِلًا لَتَعَرَفُوا إِنَّا أَكْرَمَكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهِ يَتْقَوْكُمْ إِنَّ اللَّهَ أَلِيمٌ خَبِيرٌ Which means, O oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female. I have divided you into nations and tribes, so that you shall recognize each other. Not that you shall despise each other. And the most honored in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the person who has taqwa, who has righteousness, who has God consciousness, who has piety. And Allah is all-knowing, full of knowledge. So the only criteria for judgment in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not color, it's not caste, it's not race, it's not wealth, it's not sex, it's not age, but it is taqwa. It's righteousness, it's God consciousness, it's piety. And the best example of universal brotherhood that we can see in our life is that we have to offer salah five times a day. It's compulsory. And our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Sayyid Bukhari in volume number one, in the book of Adan, chapter number 75. Hadith number 692, our beloved Prophet said that when you stand for Salah, stand shoulder to shoulder. 
so that and the other hadith says that stand shoulder to shoulder so that the devil does not come in between you a prophet was not referring to the devil which you see in the museum which has got two horns and a tail he was referring to the devil of racism of color of caste of creed of wealth that irrespective whether you are black or white whether rich or poor from whichever nation you come from when you offer salah you should stand shoulder to shoulder it increases the brotherhood and we practice universal brotherhood every day five times a day and the other beautiful example of universal brotherhood is when we go for hajj that's a pilgrimage and every muslim who has the means to perform hajj he should at least perform the hajj once in his lifetime and the gathering in hajj that is in makkah it is the biggest annual gathering in the whole world where about two and a half million people gather every year and irrespective whether they are rich or poor black or white or yellow the men they wear the same clothes they wear two piece of unsewn cloth preferably white you cannot identify the person standing next to you whether he's a king or a pauper it's the best example of universal brotherhood that we live together people from various parts of the world from japan from america from england from india from indonesia from malaysia they gather together and demonstrate the best universal brotherhood in any religion and the holy quran says in surah isra chapter number 17 verse number 17 it says walaqad karamna bani adama that we have honored the children of adam peace be upon him it does not say a particular race or a particular sex all the children of adam peace be upon him have been honored by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala the holy quran says in surah nisa chapter number 4 verse number 135 that ya ayyuhal ladina amanu O you who believe stand out firmly for justice as witness to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even if it be against yourself against your parents against your kith and kin or against the rich or poor for Allah protects both and follow not the lust of your heart lest you will be swerved neither distort justice nor decline from speaking the truth So Allah likes those who are just. That means we have to stand for justice even if it be against yourself, against your parents or against the relatives. The Holy Quran says in Surah Maida, chapter number 5, verse number 32, that if any of you kill any human being, except if it be for murder, or for creating mischief in the land it is as though he has killed all the people and if any of you save one person one human being it is as though you have saved all the people the whole of human race there was an incident at the time of Hazrat Ali may Allah be pleased with him who was the fourth khalifa of Islam that a Muslim had murdered a zimmi a zimmi is a non-muslim who is protected in an islamic state living in an islamic state he was murdered so the prophet said that this muslim who murdered a zimmi should be put to death later on the brother of the zimmi said that i don't mind forgiving the person who has murdered my brother and accepting the money that's blood money but Hazrat Ali may Allah be pleased with him he was not sure and he said no the Muslim should be put to death only later on after confirmation and after coaxing from the brother that I actually forgive him and accept the blood money then did Hazrat Ali may Allah be pleased with him let him go free and said that the life of a zimmi that is a non-muslim living in the Islamic state is as sacred as the life of a Muslim and the property of a zimmi and a muslim is equally valuable 
देर हार मेनी पीपल देर आर मेनी क्रिटिक्स हु मिस कोट द कुरान हु कोर आउट ऑफ कॉन्टेक्स एंड से दैट द होली कुरान से दैट वेर एवर यू फाइंड अ काफिर वेर एवर यू फाइंड अ नॉन मुस्लिम यू हैव टू किल हिम एंड दे कोट वेरी ऑफन सूर चौबा चैप्टर नाइन वर्स नंबर फाइव इज सेज यू शुड पुट इम टू डेथ trying to say that islam is a barbaric religion it's a ruthless religion they are quoting out of context this verse of the holy quran was revealed as there was a peace treaty between the mushriks of makka and the muslims and this peace treaty was unilaterally broken by the mushriks and later on in the battlefield this verse was revealed you have to quote it in context for example suppose the president of america or the army general of america when there is a fight between america and vietnam suppose he says to the american soldiers that wherever you find a vietnamese during the battlefield wherever you find a vietnamese you put him to death but natural he is quoting it on the battlefield he is saying it to boost the morale of the american soldiers but today if i quote the president of america saying that he said that wherever you find a vietnam you kill him i will make him sound like a butcher if i quote out of context you have to quote in context and but natural any general of the army to boost up the morale of his the soldier of the army he will but natural say that don't get scared fight the enemy and when you find them kill them that's a normal law of military and there are people like arun shuri there are critics who are quoting this verse surah tauba chapter 9 verse number 5 jump to verse number 7 any logical person can realize that he has missed verse number 6 because verse number 6 gives the answer it says that if any pagan if any mushrik if any idol worshipper if any kafir wants asylum give it to him so that he may hear the word of allah subhanahu wa taala and escort him to a place to a place of security the holy quran does not only say that if a mushrik if a kafir wants asylum just give it to him the holy quran says escort him to a place of security i want to ask that which army general today in this world will say that if the enemy wants if he wants asylum the maximum he may say is let him go free he will never say that escort him to a place of security and holy quran says that that if any enemy if any kafir wants asylum let him go free not just like that escort him to a place of security to a place of safety so people quote the quran out of context and they misquote the quran and make islam to look as though it's a ruthless religion in fact our beloved prophet muhammad peace be upon him he said that during battlefield you should not hurt any women or children that you should not chop down any trees that you should not burn any fields that you should not kill any cattle that if you have made a promise you should keep your promise you should not harm those people who have renounced the world not destroy any monastery or place of worship the holy quran says in surah muntahina chapter number 60 verse number 8 that allah forbid not that you be kind to those people who fight you not against your faith not drive you from your homes Allah loves those who are just and kind. That means Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says that amongst the non-Muslims who do not fight you, who do not drive you out of your homes, Allah expects that you be kind and just to them. So Allah loves those who are just and kind. The next verse says, Allah forbids only from behaving with those people who fight you against your faith. and drive you out of your homes 
and support those people who drive you out of your home from turning towards them for friendship and protection. For all those who do so are verily in the wrong. That means if a non-Muslim fights you against your faith, drives you out of your house and supports those people who drive you out of your house, you should not turn towards them for friendship and protection. I mean there is a misconception amongst the people that Islam was spread by the sword. And the best answer to this misconception was given by De Lacy O'Leary in his book Islam at the Crossroad on page number 8 where he says that history makes it clear history makes it clear that the legend of fanatical Muslims sweeping through the world forcing Islam at the point of the sword over conquered nations is the most fantastically absurd myth that historians have ever repeated. Dilesi O'Leary, a non-Muslim, he says this, that the historians, the most fantastically absurd myth that the historians have repeated is that Islam was forced down the throat of the people at the point of the sword. We know that we Muslims, we ruled Spain for about 800 years. We did not do the job. We did not force Islam at the point of the sword. Neither did we convey the message of Islam. We did not do Later on when the crusaders came, we Muslims were wiped out. There was not a single Muslim who could give the Azan openly. We were completely wiped out. Why? because we didn't use the sword and neither did we propagate our religion of Islam. We Muslims, we were the lordship of the Arab land for about 1400 years. A few years the Britishers came, a few years the French came, but overall we Muslims ruled Arabia for about 1400 years and still we are ruling it. Today, we will be shocked to know that there are 14 million Coptic Christians who are Arabs living in Arabia. Coptic Christians mean they were born, they were born as Christians. That means there are more than 14 million non-Muslims living in the hearts of the Muslims. If Islam was spread by the sword, there would not have been a single non-Muslim in the Arab land. It's a living proof that Islam was not spread by the sword. We Muslims, we ruled India, the Mughals. They ruled India for a, about a thousand years. But we didn't do the job properly. We did not propagate the religion of Islam. We didn't do Dawah. Neither did we convert anyone at the point of the sword. If we would have converted, all the non-Muslims at the point of the sword, there would not have been a single non-Muslim living in India. And today we know that the Muslim population is hardly about 15%. It's a minority. And the non-Muslims are about 85%. If Islam was spread at the point of the sword, there would not have been a single non-Muslim living in the whole of India. The non-Muslims living in India are giving shahada. They are giving witness that Islam was not spread by the sword. I want to ask the question, that which army went to Malaysia? More than 50% of the Malaysians are Muslims. Which army went to Indonesia? More than 90% of the Indonesians are Muslim. And the country which has the maximum number of Muslims in any country is Indonesia. Which army went to Indonesia? Which army conquered the east coast of Africa? Which sword? The answer is given by Thomas Carlyle in his book Heroes and Hero Worship, which he mentioned on page number 80. That sword, indeed it was the sword. But every new opinion initially starts in the minority of one. In one man's head alone it dwells. One man against the whole world. One man against all the human beings. 
it will do little good that you should spread with a sword. You should first get the sword. So that it will propagate itself with sword. The sword of the intellect. The Holy Quran says in Surah Nahal, chapter 16, verse number 125, it says, That is, invite all to the way of thy Lord with wisdom and beautiful preaching and argue with them and reason with them in the ways that are best and most gracious. <coughs> According to the Reader Digest, al Manik and your book that was mentioned in 1986, it said, it gave the statistics of the increase of the various religions of the world from the year 1934 to 1984. In the span of 50 years, various religion, it gave the increase of various religions, the growth of various religion. And number one was Islam, 235%. And Christianity was hardly 47%. I want to ask that which Muslim army converted people in this last century? Which Muslim forced people to accept Islam at the point of the sword? Which Muslim in this past half a century? Today in America, the fastest growing religion is Islam. In Europe, the fastest growing religion is Islam. I want to know that Muslim, which Muslim in America and Europe is converting people at the point of the sword? Which Muslim? The Holy Quran clearly gives the answer. And as I mentioned, that Islam is a secular religion. It's the most secular religion because it does not believe in monasticism and it deals with worldly affairs. But Islam is very tolerant to secularism. But secularism is intolerant towards Islam. Because secularism says that we have nothing to do with anything which is sacred and religious. They aren't bothered about the truth, whether they speak the truth or not. If it is sacred, we will not tolerate it. If it is religious, we will not tolerate it. So secularism is intolerant towards Islam. And Islam, alhamdulillah, is very tolerant towards secularism. The sword. Which sword? Which sword is making people accept Islam? The Holy Quran says in Surah Tawbah, chapter number 9, Verse number 33 and Surah Al-Saf, chapter number 61, verse number 9, it says, Who is the Arsal Rasul of Biluda? What deen al haq? Leo Zero al Deen Kulli, follow Kariyar Mushikun. That Allah has sent His Messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms, whether it be atheism, whether it be secularism, whether capitalism, whether socialism, whether Christianism, Judaism, Hinduism, Islam is destined to supersede all, to overcome them all, kulli, to master them all, however much the mushrik don't like it. And the similar message is repeated in Surah Fatah, chapter number 48, verse number 28, where it says, Who is the one who is the one who is the one who is that it is Allah who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth so that it will prevail over all the other ways of life, over all the other isms, whether that be secularism, atheism, socialism, capitalism, Christianism, Judaism, Buddhism, Hinduism. Islam is destined to supersede all, overcome them all, master them all, and enough is Allah as a witness. Which sword, even if he had a laser gun, we could not have used it because the Holy Quran says in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 256, like Rahafid Deen, there is no compulsion in religion. Truth stands out clear from error. Even if he had a laser gun, we could not use it. Which sword? Our sword is the Holy Quran. Our laser gun is the Holy Quran. It reaches the heart directly. It conquers the mind directly. This is our laser gun. This is our sword. And I started my talk 
by quoting a verse from the Holy Quran from Surah Isra, chapter number 17, verse number 81 and 82, which says, Wakul Jal Haq wa Zakal Batil, Inna la Batil Akana Zahuka, Varuna Zuluminal Quran Amah wa Shifa wa Rahmatul al Mu'minin, Vala is the Zalimin illa Khasara. That when truth is heard against falsehood, falsehood perishes. For by its nature, falsehood is bound to perish. The Holy Quran was revealed in stages so that it will be a mercy and a healing to the believers. And as for those who are unjust, it is nothing but loss after loss. Which sword? Which sword are we using? And the answer is given very well. I would like to end it with the quotation of Dr. Adam Pearson. Dr. Adam Pearson said that people who worry that one day nuclear weaponry will fall in the hands of the Arabs. They fail to realize that the Islamic bomb has already been dropped. It fell the day Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was born. Yes, brother, most welcome. Wa alaikum as salam. If we read the modern history of Islam, say for example, time. No problem. I'll repeat the question. You can say, brother. From the time of the British time, it seems that under the colon during the colonial period, Muslims did a better job of organization and educating one another with less technology than they do today. Can you? possibly explain why this is? So the brother has asked the question that in modern history, for example, Egypt, he said. Contemporary writers, whether they're Muslim or non-Muslim, tend to start what they consider to be the modern period of uh, Islamic history with the, con the British conquest of Egypt in the 1880s. Now, the brother said that in modern Islamic history, example, Egypt, when we won the colonial rule, by British, etc. We did more progress. After that, we came down. Why is it so? But if you analyze that the media, the media has been controlled by the non-Muslims, mainly by the Westerners. So what they teach us, we hear. We may not know whether it's the truth or not. The Western media says that from the 8th century till the 11th century, it was the Dark Ages. Dark for whom? It was dark for the Westerners. In fact, science was at its peak. With the limited resources, the amount of advance made the Arabs made, they were at the top. But because it was dark for the Westerners, they said the Dark Age. It was not the Dark Age. With the limited resources, with the limited equipment that we had, the amount the Arab scholars, Alhamdulillah, they progressed is phenomenal. But people don't know about them. For example, blood circulation. If you ask a normal layman, who has discovered it? Most of them will say William Harvey. 1000 years after the Quran was revealed. But they don't know that 400 years before William Harvey, Ibn Nafis had talked about the blood circulation. But no one knows Ibn Nafis, everyone knows William Harvey. See, astronomy was at its peak at the time. If you analyze, you can give a talk only on the achievement made by the Muslims much before that in the 8th to the 11th century. For example, Ali Drusi, he drew the map of the world in 1159, 1154, sorry, when people thought the world was flat. Everyone knows Pythagoras theorem. Who discovered it? Ali Drusi. That the square of the hypotenuse of a triangle is equal to the sum of the other two sides of the triangle. Who discovered it? Who knows about Al-Kindi? Al-Kindi, he was a famous philosopher, as an astronomer. When people like Descartes and Newton and Galileo said that all physical laws are absolute, Al-Kindi said that it was relative. Later on, Albert Einstein, he took the theory of Al-Kindi and did more research and talked about the theory of relativity. He got a Nobel Prize. Everyone knows about Albert Einstein, no one knows about Al-Kindi. Muhammad, Shakir, Ahmed, these three brothers, they said the exact surface area of the earth by measuring a degree at the Red Sea. No one knows about them in chemistry. If you know Jabir ibn Hayyan, known as Jabir by the Western world, he wrote 2,000 pages on chemistry. He discovered alcohol 
I call the Arabic word coming from Al Ghul, meaning spirit. Same with Mama Zakaria Razi. He was an authority in, in the disease of smallpox and measles. Ibn Sina, known as the Aristotle of the East. He wrote two volumes, The Disease and the Cure. We were very much advanced. But because the media is in their hand, we don't know about it. But I also partly agree with you, brother, that we Muslims today aren't advancing. You know why? Because we have gone away from our religion. We have gone away from the Quran. And the reason the Westerners are advancing, the answer is the same. Because they have gone away from their religion. Muslims have become backward because they have gone away from our religion. The Westerners have become advanced because they have gone away from their religion. The answer is the same. So if you analyze, we Muslims, alhamdul now, Alhamdulillah, previously we were close to the Quran. Now we are going away from the Quran. So if you stick to the Quran, the say hadith, inshallah, once again we'll be on the top. Hope that's the question. I mean, if there are questions from sister side, they can give it on a chit of paper. And inshallah, we'll have one from Jen, one from one sister side. Women's role in society, are they allowed to work if yes? Under what condition? I have given this answer in detail in my video cassette. Women's rights in Islam modernizing outdated. The question posed was, can a woman work in Islam? And if yes, under what condition? First we should realize that the financial obligation in a family is laid on the shoulder of the man. Before a when we deal with the Christians, how do we deal the topic of original sin or about attainment? <laughs> Atonement. They say they have a concept of original sin. That because Adam peace be upon him, he had the apple, he sinned. And it was Eve, peace be upon her, that she tempted Adam to eat the apple. So because of her, all humankind is born in sin. And the Bible, it curses in Genesis chapter number 3, verse number 16. It says, you woman, you shall toil in labor pain. It was a curse given by God Almighty. Because she sinned, pregnancy is a curse. In the Holy Quran, pregnancy uplifts the woman. It says in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 1, respect the womb that bore you. Pregnancy uplifts the woman. But the Bible degrades degrade the woman. Saying the labor pain is a curse. Now coming to your question, how will you deal with them? That because they sinned, every human being is born in sin. I ask a question to the Christian, that did Adam peace be upon him before eating the forbidden fruit? Did he ask me? He didn't ask me. So if he didn't ask me, how am I to blame? If you have asked me, then you could have said, okay, I guided him that you eat the forbidden fruit. Then you can blame me. If he asked you, then fine, he didn't ask me. So when Adam peace be upon him, and if peace be upon her, when they didn't ask me, how am I to blame? But the Christian missionary is the quote. The quote that is mentioned in the Bible, in the, in the book of Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, they say, the soul that sinned shall die. That means any soul that commits a sin, they shall die. Therefore, since Adam and Eve, peace be upon them, they ate the forbidden fruit, every humankind is born in sin. Therefore, for receiving salvation, you have to believe in Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, that he died for a sin. They are quoting half the verse of the Bible. Ezekiel chapter number 18, verse number 20, does say, the soul that sinneth shall die. But they are putting a full stop where there is no full stop. It continues and says, the son shall not bear the iniquity of the father, neither the father shall bear the iniquity of the son. If the sin of the son will not be borne by the father, neither the father shall bear the sins of the son. The righteousness of the righteous shall be upon him. The wickedness of the wicked shall be upon him. But if the wicked turn, they shall not die. So the Bible says, according to Ezekiel, chapter number 18, verse number 20, that sin is not inherited. So your whole theory of the original sin is proved false by your own Bible. The Quran clearly says that no bearer of the burden can bear the burden of the other. No bearer of whatever you do, you will be held responsible. What your father does, he will be held responsible. And same message is given in the Bible. Hope that answers the question. <coughs> and sister asked a question that Judaism and Christianism is mentioned in the Holy Quran and that it's a deen. Why is not Hinduism and Buddhism etc. mentioned in the Holy Quran as a deen? 
sister nowhere does the Quran say that Christianism and Judaism is a deen. The Quran clearly says, Inna deena in the Lahil Islam. I start my talk by quoting that. The only religion, the only deen acceptable in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is Islam. It's not a way of life, it's a religion. Judaism and Christianity, the Quran speaks about that. It speaks about Ahle Kitab, but it never says that it's the right way of life. It never says that it's a right deen. By, by name, the Holy Quran mentions four revelations. The Torah, the Zabur, the Injil and the Furqan. The Torah is the Wahi, the revelation given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the revelation, the Wahi given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, that is the Holy Quran, is the Wahi, the revelation given to the last and final messenger, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. But otherwise, Several revelations that came down the face of the earth. For example, so for Ibrahim. There were revelations given to other prophets. By name, there are only 25 prophets mentioned in the Holy Quran. Adam, Noah, Abraham, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all. But our tradition say that there are 124,000 prophets sent on the face of the earth. So Hinduism and Buddhism, they aren't mentioned in the Quran. That does not mean they did not exist. Because only four revelations have been mentioned by name and only 25 messengers have been mentioned by name in the Holy Quran. But the Holy Quran says in Surah Fatir, chapter number 20, chapter 35, verse number 24, it says, Wa immin ummatin illa khalafiha nazid. There is not a nation or a tribe to whom we have not sent a warner or a guide. Quran says in Surah Raj, chapter 13, verse number 7, Wa likulli in had. To every nation have we sent a warner or a guide. So these about Hinduism, Buddhism, Parsiism, the Quran does not specify. But that does not mean because the Quran does not speak about it, they did not exist at all. They existed. The like Quran says in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse 62 that all those who follow the Quran and the scriptures, the Jewish people, the Christian people and the Sabians. Who are the Sabians? They say they were in between. In between Christians and Jews, some people say. Some people say they are the fire worshippers. They can refer to the Parsi people. Whatever it is, there are religions besides Islam, Christianity and Judaism. But the name is not mentioned in the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Please, those who have not asked before, I'll give them the chance first. Yes, brother. Sure. Thank you very much. Please, would you prefer having one, one question from the gen side, one from the lady side, so that we will do justice to both? If you can, one question from the gen side, one from the lady side. Yes, brother. In view of the obvious threat to our children in the public school system, the threat of immorality and moral corruption and anti-religious influences, because I have seen propaganda being distributed, uh, magazines like New Youth Connections, which teach children things that are absolutely corrupt and abnormal, etc. I won't go in, I won't mention details since this is the house of God. Um, what, uh, if any, uh, attempts are being uh, uh, done by the Muslim community to protect the Muslim children? I mean, is, are they attempting to take them to religion, to all the uh, parochial or religious schools, or also the, the New York State law permits homeschooling by parents to take children out of the public school? This, I believe, is permitted. Are there these efforts within the Muslim community? I 
I'd just like to make clarification. You said that in the school there is something against something. You said I didn't get that word clearly. In the public school there is something against Islam. Against morality. Against morality. Teaching about homosexuality, abortion, etc., condoms, and all these. I'm sorry. That's right. The brother asked a very good question. That public schools you have teaching which are against morality. Like homosexuality, about abortion, and various sexual things, etc. Do we in Islam have certain schools? Since the government gives permission that you can have Islamic schools, have we made an effort, brother? Regarding the first part of the question, that all these immoral teaching comes when there is co-education, more of co-education. I'll first deal with that, and then the second part of the question. There was a survey done in UK in the schools. And when they asked the teachers of the school, they said that students in unisex schools they concentrated much better than students in the co-ed school, because in co-ed school the students they spend more time in trying to impress the opposite sex than on paying attention to what was taught by the teachers. Same out here in in America, according to New York Times, New York Times as well as the Time magazine. It said that 25 percent, 25 percent of the women going to university they are raped. They are raped. And it says that in American school, the children learn more about sex than what is taught to them by the teachers. And recently, I read in several papers, not once, at least five times in my short stay, I learned that that there was a, most of the male student they try and harass the female student, and when the female student takes an objection, they, no one hears them. And yesterday, I just read in the papers, I don't know which paper it was, here I come in the front page, that once a young girl. A young girl, she was molested by a student, 14 years old student. When she complained, and the principal gave a warning to the student that if you do it again, you will be rusticated. He again repeated the act. When the principal rusticated that young boy of 14 years, the board of school they took objection that you cannot rusticate a student. Imagine. He molests a girl, and the education board supports him. I do agree with you that the society is going down; it's becoming immoral. Therefore, in Islam, we do not encourage intermingling of sexes. Intermingling of sexes is haram; it's forbidden, and we encourage the students that preferable go in unisex schools. If you go to unisex schools, but natural, this immorality will become less. Regarding the second part of the question, that since the government gives permission that you can have homeschool, etc., are we making any effort out here? I'm not very well aware of America, but I do know in several parts of the world that there are Islamic schools. And we see to it that there is a striking balance. Alhamdulillah, that besides teaching them the normal curriculum of the government, what should be taught? I'm talking about moral things, not the immoral things. The moral things, history, geography, science, etc. Besides that, we even teach our moral values of the Quran and the authentic Hadith. Now, instead of the class being maybe from nine to three, it's from nine to five. Two hours additional. So that this two hours additional knowledge of the Quran and the Sahih Hadith, or instead of five days a week, the Islamic schools run for six days a week. There are several in the world, in South Africa, in London, and I believe there are a few also in in the states, in Chicago, in Atlanta, and surely there will be New Yorkers. I I don't know about them, but there will be. Besides that, we also have weekend schools. That if we can't give them the Islamic knowledge. Islamic moral teachings in the public school they go to weekend school which is on Saturdays and Sundays or only on Sunday or only on Saturdays where they get the moral values so that they at least remain on the true path. Hope that's the question. Waalaikum assalam. Reference to food here. Some Muslims say it's okay to eat what is kosher, or just say Bismillah and eat anything else except pork, of course. I would like if you can elaborate a little on what the Sharia says. This question of food halal and haram. 
Fifth child asked a question regarding haram and halal foods. Fifth child gave the talk, scientific reason for dietary laws in Islam, and they have spoken in detail regarding haram and halal. There are several things which are haram and halal. Just to mention a few, the Quran says in no less than four different places, in Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 173, in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3, in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 145, and Surah Nahal chapter number 16 verse number 115. It says, Hurramat alaykum ul maitu tu waddamu wa rahmah kanzeed, wa ma ahulla li gairillah bih. That means sovereign for you for food, ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. These four things are prohibited. There are other things also prohibited by beloved prophet, that any carnivorous animal that is having claws and can I in teeth is prohibited. Quran says in Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 90, Ya ayu alladhina amanu, O you who believe, innam al-khamru al-maythuru, most certain intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al-aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishtum min amali shaitan, these are certain handiwork, fashtani mu'ula lakum tuflihun, abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. That means alcohol is prohibited, gambling, etc. Regarding the scientific reasons, I have given my cassette. But what I feel, sister, that though your question was very broad based, what is halal, what you are what you're really meaning to ask is that is food like McDonald's, chicken, mutton, is it allowed or not? So, is that a main question? That can we have chicken from McDonald's, say Bismillah, and have it? That's right. Though your question was broad based, what is haram and halal? You can go talk on that. You can speak the full day. This question has been following me everywhere. I went to Atlanta, they asked. I went to Houston, they asked the same question. I went to San Antonio, they asked the same question. I'm here, they're asking the same question. That is having chicken and mutton from McDonald's and Kentucky allowed or not? And since I've asked this question, I know the background. Because Yusuf al Khardavi, he's a great scholar, I've read his book and I respect him. I really refer to his book for, for several of my answers. He said that since the Quran says people of the food of the people of the book is allowed, you can have it. What Yusuf al Qardawi, Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi is referring to is Surah Maida, chapter 5, verse number 5. He says, Lawful for you from today is the food of the people of the book, and your food is lawful for them. Means for you, the food of the people of the book is lawful, and for them, your food is lawful. So that means you can have the food of the Hale Kitab. But when the question is posed to Yusuf al Qardawi, Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi, is pork allowed? He said, no, pork is not allowed. He said, why? Because pork is prohibited in the Bible. Therefore, even if the people of the book serve you pork, you can't have pork. This is the answer given by Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi. That's the reason I'm told that most of the Arabs here, they feel that if you have mutton or chicken from Kentucky or McDonald's, it becomes halal. Now, point number one you should realize that they are basing the argument on the four verses I quoted. Surah Baqarah chapter 2 verse number 173, Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 3, Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 145, and Surah Nahal chapter 16 verse number 115 which says, That is problem for you for food, ah, dead meat, blood, the flesh of swine, and any food on which any name besides Allah has been invoked. Means if on the food any name besides Allah has been invoked, it becomes harm for you. So since the Ahl Kitab out here, the Christians, they don't take the name of anyone other than Allah. Neither do they take Allah's name, neither do they take any name. Therefore, this food becomes halal for you. I would like to point out to them that we as Muslims should not follow only few verses of the Quran, we should follow the whole Quran. Quran clearly states in Surah Anam, chapter number 6, verse number 118 and verse number 119 that you should only have the meat of that meat on which Allah's name has been taken. Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 118, that the name of Allah should be taken on the meat, otherwise it is haram for you. So based on some verses of the Quran, Kentucky is allowed. So if you want to follow part of Islam, then you can have the food of Kentucky. But if you want to follow full Islam, the whole of the Quran, Quran clearly states in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 118, that name of Allah should be taken. Since in Kentucky and McDonald's, I doubt whether they take the name of Allah, therefore it becomes haram for you.
following the full Quran. Now coming to the argument of Yusuf al-Qardawi. Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi said that since pork is haram, mentioned in the Bible, therefore it is not the food of the people of the book. So even if a Christian gives you pork, it is haram for you. I agree with Sheikh al-Qardawi. That the Bible says in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 11, verse number 7 and 8. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 8. And in the book of Isaiah, chapter number 65, verse number 2 to 5, it says that the flesh of swine is prohibited for the Jews and the Christians. Therefore, pork is haram. Fine. But Yusuf al-Qardawi, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi forgot that the Bible clearly mentions in the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 15, and in the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 14, verse number 21, that dead meat is also prohibited. Bible says in no less than five different places that blood is prohibited. In the book of Leviticus, chapter number 17, verse number 14. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter number 12, verse number 16. In the book of Genesis, chapter number 9, verse number 6. In the second Samuel, chapter number 14, verse number 33. And in the book of Acts, chapter number 15, verse number 29. No less than five places the Bible says blood is prohibited. So even a Christian should do zabiha. If he's not doing, he's not following the Bible. So based on the argument of Sheikh Yusuf al-Qardawi, he did not know that even the Bible says blood is prohibited and, and even dead meat is prohibited. So based on this argument, even doing Zabiha is compulsory for Jews and the Christian. Alhamdulillah, the Jews do Zabiha. So you can of course have the food which is kosher of the Jews. But of the Christians which don't do Zabiha, you cannot have. And one more criteria is required that the name of Allah should be taken. So if a Jew does not take the name of Allah, even that's haram for you. I know many people will argue because when the moment I give this answer, most of the Arabs they come and they say, Sheikh bin Bas said this, Sheikh so and so said this, Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi said that. I said, see, if you can get me the name of 10 Sheikhs who said that having Kentucky is halal, I can get you 20 Sheikhs who said it's haram. We Muslims should not follow any Sheikh. I have respect for Sheikh bin Bas. I have respect for Sheikh Yusuf al Qardawi. I respect them. I refer to their books. But you should realize all of these are human beings, even I am a human being. You should not follow what I say. You should not follow what a Sheikh says. You should follow what the Holy Quran says. Holy Quran clearly prohibits in Surah Anam chapter 6 verse number 118 that meat on which the name of Allah has not been taken, it is haram for you. So surely, whether it be Kentucky, whether it be McDonald's, if you have any meat which is not Zabiha, which the name of Allah has not been taken, whether it's served by Ahle Kitab, even if it's served by the Muslims, even if it's served by a Muslim, and if it's a haram meat, it is haram for you. If unknowingly, unknowingly if you have it, unknowingly if I go to a Muslim house, and if I don't know that is Abiyah, and if I have, inshallah Allah will forgive me. Because Allah says, unwillingly if you disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah is Rahman or Rahim. But otherwise if you know for sure it is not Zabiha, the name of Allah is not taking, you should not have it. People told me in San Antonio, that see, we don't get Zabiha meat. They failed to realize that when I come earlier in states, it was difficult for me to find halal meat. But now, alhamdulillah, in New York, there are several restaurants which sell halal meat. In San Antonio there are, in Atlanta there is. But the question is, halal meat, for one pound you have to pay maybe one dollar extra. The other meat, it is cheap. To get halal meat, you may have to travel one mile extra. So in order to save the trouble for us, we try and find loopholes. Which is wrong. If you want to be a Muslim, you have to follow all the words of the Holy Quran. And I hope that answers the question, sister. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know. Small question. Yes, I know that. The moment I give this answer, there has to be a follow-up and I welcome it. Yeah, because there's something very important. Yes. Muslim obvious give the slaughter of the enemy, even in saying in the name of Allah, as far as the intention. It's in the name of Allah, that's acceptable because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to score him. And the hadith of Qudsi says, I give it. So, if the Muslim has the intention to slaughter, even he didn't say it or announce it, that's not for Of course. If intention is there, fine. I mean, that's fine. If the intention is there, slaughtering, of course. Of course, it's halal for you. Okay. Is there a question there? Yes. Go ahead, please. Yes. Uh, 
one of the procedures that's done, it means one utterance is done by the rabbi, and uh, the animal is uh, in mass they are slaughtered. Now we also know that that group of, of uh, Jews uh, who slaughter the meat in that manner, the Orthodox Jews do not partake of that meat. So I'm wondering if there are other nuances that Muslims need to be apprised of in reference to this question. And uh, uh, and this is on the economic side. Even if the meat of Ahli Kitab is halal for Muslims, uh, at, point, at what point can we begin to move our own economic basis and support our own by purchasing uh, meat that... So, so I have two questions. So I have two questions. So the first question is that some Jews, they have naf slaughter, which the Orthodox Jews don't believe in it, and they don't have from them. If the mass slaughter is not Zabiha, name of Allah, not taking, it's haram for us, whether the Orthodox Jews have it or don't have it. So it should determine whether the Jews, they slaughter it in the Islamic manner. If you have a doubt, you cannot determine, then have the Muslim meat, that's safer. If you can determine, and if it follows the rules of the Sharia, you're allowed to have. Regarding my second question. Shouldn't we support the Muslims? How long are we going to have the food of the people of the book, etc.? Shouldn't we purchase from the Muslims, etc.? Sister, I agree with you. But if you ask me that can a person buy food in the Ahle Kitab or the Hindu shop, I said as long as it is halal, it is allowed for you. I won't say it is haram. But if you ask which is preferable, I would say yes. It is preferred that we give business to our Muslim brothers. Preferable. I won't say it is haram to have the food. If it falls within the Sharia level, it's not haram. But if you ask me, is it preferred to buy from a non-Muslim shop or a Muslim shop, I would say it is preferable that you buy from a Muslim shop. So that our money helps our own Muslim brother, even if he charges maybe 25 cents more, so that he gets a profit, so that the money circulates among the Muslims. So I agree with you, sister, that if we have a good hold on the Muslim community, but we should be careful that when we plan such strategies, we should be careful it should not backfire. It should not backfire. I mean, depending on where you're living and which situation are you in. Other if it backfire, we'll be in the loss. So if it's done, it should be done with hikmah and husna. Backfiring means if you're a minority, minority, just. And if they start boycotting you, then you may have trouble. Then you have to plan of a strategy with hikmah. Otherwise, I agree with your policy that Muslims should support Muslims. Hope that's the question. From the Islamic perspective on Darwin's theory of evolution, the, what is our stand basically on that? The brother asked the question that what is the Islamic stance on Darwin's theory? <coughs> on Darwin's theory, theory of evolution, that human beings have been created from it. Brother, if you read the book of Origin of Species, Darwin traveled on a ship named HMS Vega and went to an island by the name of Calatropis. And there he saw birds, birds, the finches, they pecked at holes. Depending upon the niche, the hole they pecked, the beak kept on becoming small and big. Based on this knowledge, Darwin said that I believe in the theory of evolution that one species can transform to the other. But he had no proof for that. In fact, he wrote a letter to his friend Thomas Thompson in the year 1861 that I don't believe in the theory of evolution because I've got proof, but because it helps me in classification of embryology, morphology, rudimentary organs. He had no proof for that. But unfortunately today, it is taught in the school as a fact. It's not a fact, it's a theory. Darwin's theory is just a hypothesis. There's no proof for that at all. I know there are vestiges, there are some fossils, that from that we can say that, okay, this, we have been evolved from it. According to P.P. Grasse, in the year 1971, he held the chair of the evolutionary studies in, in Paris. He said that we cannot decipher who were the ancestors just based on few vestiges. Vestiges means fossils. And we know today there are four ways, if you know about the hominoids. There are four ways of hominoids. The first is Lucy. That's the first is Lucy Australopithecus. 
which came about three and a half million years ago and died by the ice age. The second wave was the Homo erectus, which died about 500,000 to 150,000 years ago. Third was the Neanderthal man, which died about 40,000 years ago. And last was the Cro-Magnon. See, the Quran says in Surah Nu, chapter 71, verse number 14, that the human beings have been created in stages. But there is no proof that one hominoid has been transformed to the other. And there is no proof showing that we have been transformed from the human being. No proof at all. Where it comes to, do you believe in Darwin's theory? Some people say it's totally wrong, some people say it's totally right. We Muslims are in between. Today there is some proof on one species turning to another in the lower level, like amoeba. Nowhere does the Quran say that amoeba cannot transform into another species. But there is no proof at all at a higher level, at the animal level or at the level of the human beings. There is no proof at all, it's a hypothesis. But unfortunately, this hypothesis is taught in the schools and universities as a fact. No wonder we say that if we have to insult someone, we say that if you were present at Darwin's time, Darwin's theory would have been proved right. Trying to insinuate he looks like an ape. There is no proof at all. There are missing links which Darwin himself said. It's just an assumption. So Alhamdulillah, Quran does not agree that we have been evolved from ape. The first set of human beings that came on the world was Adam and Eve, peace be upon them. There are researches being done to prove that. And some scientists say that yet agree we have come from one pair. But yet it, ha it hasn't been testified yet. It's just under research. So Darwin's theory is an outdated theory. No scholar believes in it today. Only those who don't have uploaded knowledge will say it is right. It's an assumption. Maybe it may be true. But it's not a fact at all. So we don't have to test Quran with assumptions. If anyone wants to test the Quran is right or wrong, ask him to get any scientific fact and there is not a single verse of the Holy Quran which goes against scientific facts. Hope that answers the question. Yes. Yes, sister. Yes, one gents, one ladies. One gents, one ladies. Yes, sister. Wa alaikum salam. in Surah Room, chapter number 30, verse number 39, and Surah Nisa, chapter number 4, verse number 161, in Surah Al Imran, chapter number 3, verse number 130, in Surah Al Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 275, thrice in that verse, in Surah Al Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 276, and in Surah Al Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 278, and which you quoted rightly, the Holy Quran says, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanatu qullah, wa zaru ma bakhi min al rimah, that O oh, you believe, O oh, you who believe, fear Allah, and give up what remains of the demands of riba. 
فَإِلَّمْ تَفَعَلُوا And if you do it not, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. The Holy Quran says, if you indulge in riba, take notice of a war from Allah and His Rasul. Allah and His Rasul will wage jihad with you. And I do agree with your sister, who has the guts in the world to wage a war against Allah and His Rasul? Why is there a difference of opinion between the various scholars on riba? The reason is because those scholars who say, all the scholars agree riba is haram. All the scholars. No scholar says riba is haram. But the difference of opinion is, some scholars say, the modern day interest does not include riba. <laughs> While others say, interest includes riba. Now to solve the difference, sister, the complete answer, you can refer to my video cassette, interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran, and I feel it's available for sale also here, interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran, and I've described in detail, not only to a Muslim from the Quran, I've even proved to a non-Muslim why interest is wrong. Proof to a non-Muslim that if you don't take interest, you will flourish in business. If a non-Muslim won't agree in the Holy Quran, so what's the reason of him telling that Allah will wage a war against you? He does not believe in the Quran. So a proof to a non-Muslim on economic terms, terms based on the banking level, the cash ratio, reserve ratio, use their terminology to prove to them that interest will get you nowhere, it will bring you more loss. Now coming to your question on riba. The difference of opinion about riba. The actual meaning of the Arabic word riba means addition to, over and above the original amount. That's the meaning of riba. Now if you analyze, what is the meaning of interest in the Oxford Dictionary? Interest means amount paid for the use of amount lent. That means if you pay a certain amount of percentage for the use of money, that's interest. And usury is exorbitant interest. That means interest is smaller part of usury and usury is bigger portion of interest, according to Oxford Dictionary. Now, as I mentioned, riba means over and above the original amount. It does not say little or big. So irrespective of whether it is little or big, both are haram. So riba includes both into modern interest of the banking as well as usury. It includes both and it's made haram for both. There are various arguments people can give. It means riba is talaq of business, not this riba. All these answers, sisters, I've given in detail in my video cassette. Interest-free economy promulgated by the Quran. So irrespective of whether it is modern banking, anything which is a fixed amount, fixed amount of money paid for a use of fixed amount, it is haram. Then some people say, see, taking interest is haram. What about giving interest? That's allowed. See, the Quran clearly states, anyone who indulges in, doesn't say paying interest or taking interest, both. And our beloved Prophet said, it's mentioned in Tirmidhi and the other hadith, that anyone who takes interest, who gives interest, who's a middle party, and the person who records, all four will burn in hell. All four. So whether you take or give or be a witness or record it, if you're a witness for opening a saving account or a fixed deposit account, even you are involved in riba. All four types of people it's prohibited. For detailed answers, you can refer to my video cassette in the That's a very good question. That's, that's a very good question. And this question will ask to me in that cassette and answer is given there also. One person asked me the same question as sister asked that agreed. Giving riba is haram, taking riba is haram. So what we do, we'll take riba and we'll give it in charity. We will not take a single pie of it and we'll buy footwear, some people say. Some alim has given the fatwa that you can you can make toilets. Some say you can build toilets of the mosque. Some people are given charity, various fatwas. I'm not going to speak on that. What question I pose to these people who say that take riba, don't use it for self and give in charity. So I tell them that brother, I want to start a business, business in drug dealing, heroin and cocaine. I invest a hundred thousand dollars and every month I make a profit of two hundred thousand dollars. My hundred thousand I get back and two hundred thousand dollars every month I make. So I ask them the question that see, I know dealing with drugs is haram. 
The profit I get out of it, I don't spend even a single cent on my sin. On myself. I give the full two hundred thousand dollars in charity to orphans and to make toilets and to buy footwear. Is it allowed? He said, No, it is haram. I said, Why? Because drunk is haram. It's mentioned in the Holy Quran. I said, See, Holy Quran says alcohol and drug. Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Surah Maida chapter 5 verse number 90 Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu Innam al-khamru al-maithiru Most certainly intoxicants and gambling Wal anzabu al-aslamu Dedication of stones, divination of arrows Rishtum min amali shaitan These are certain handiwork First alibu ula lukum duflihun Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper The Quran says alcohol is prohibited But Quran does not say if you deal in drugs Allah will wage a war against you So interest is a bigger haram so when you can't, when you can't allow me to do, to do, to do dealing in drugs and give my profit in charity, then how can you take interest and give the profit in charity? I'm doing a smaller crime. And the Islamic State has said if you have option between the two smaller is better than bigger. So I'm doing a smaller crime and I'm giving in charity. So when you say this is haram, then I say a bigger crime is a bigger haram. So surely I don't agree with that philosophy that take money and give it in charity. The philosophy is you're encouraging the system, don't involve in interest at all. People say, how will we keep our money safe? I say, put in an Islamic bank. If there's no Islamic bank, put in a current account. Current account which does not deal with interest. And see to it that you don't put too much money in the current account also. Why simply let them have it? Do business, do tijarat, earn profit and not sharing. And how to do that? I have explained my cassette, interest pay economy, per Quran. Hope that's the question. Okay. Uh, excuse me, one more question from sister and then we're going to be ready for brain maghrib and then we'll continue inshallah. One more question only from the sister. Inshallah. So if you all want to ask question, I am willing. It's my pleasure. Wa alaikum as -salam. My question is regarding small children, boys and girls engaging in sexual activities. I would like to know, Islamically, ranging from the age of four and five, we taught that they should not play with. The sister posed the question that young boys and girls, young children, are the age of four to five. When they play with each other, should we bring a prohibition? Is it right or is it wrong, etc.? Sister, I wouldn't say that it is haram as such, because the Holy Quran says in Surah Nur, chapter 24, verse number 30, that do hijab with so and so people, except those who extreme of ages. So it gives permission that among the young children you can. But that does not mean that you should encourage. I wouldn't say it is haram. If someone is doing, I won't say it is haram, but you're encouraging them. Because what a child learns in the childhood, he he adopts the same thing when he grows up. The moment they become mature, then it becomes haram. The moment a child becomes elder, 14, 15, etc., it becomes haram. They cannot play with each other. Girls and boys can't intermingle unless they are mahram. Brothers and sisters can. Brothers and sisters, mother and daughter, whatever it is, can. So I would say it is not good to encourage the Muslim children to play with the opposite sex of a nahmahram. You teach them good values from the beginning and they will keep that values. Similar with hijab. A small girl of the age of four, she need not do hijab. But if you encourage from the beginning, daughter, wear a scarf, at least if not 100% time, at least 50% of the time, then make it 75%. If you start teaching her from the age of eight, nine to wear skirt and mini, and when she becomes a little bit older, saying, okay, now it's haram for you. Stop it. A direct change is difficult, sister. So you should teach the children from childhood, from day one. Similarly, with all the other aspects, inculcate the Islamic values. Like when the children play, instead of playing the modern games, like Monopoly, how they teach you to earn money, earn money and make you a businessman. Let them play the Islamic version which produced in UK, the Step to Paradise, and I feel it's available here. That they try and earn sawab. It makes them a better Muslim, not a better businessman or a businesswoman. So encourage your children from the childhood about Islamic ethics and values. I wouldn't say it is haram. I would say encourage them to wear the hijab, the girls. Let them not intermingle freely with the other people. Brothers and sisters are fine so that they grow up to be good Muslims. Hope that answers the question, sister. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.
If there are any pending questions on Islam and comparative religion or the propagation of, of Islam, you're most welcome. Yes, brother. First question, that is dunya part of Islam, yes it is. And the second question you posed when you said Bismillah Rahman and go out of Islam. You said Bismillah. Before we go to our words, before we eat, before we do anything, Bismillah. Is that still secular? The brother asked the question that when we say Bismillah Rahman and Rahim, is that secular or not? That's what if you heard my talk, brother, I made very clear that Islam tolerates secularism. One of the definitions of secularism is dealing with worldly affairs. And Islam says you should deal with worldly affairs. Second definition of secularism is that anything which is non-monastic, Islam is non-monastic. Now secularism says that it is against sacred things, against religion. So secularism cannot tolerate Islam. Islam can tolerate secularism. So Islam, when you say Bismillah Rahman Rahim, Islam tolerates it. But secularism does not tolerate Islam. How will answer the question? Yes, brother. Wa alaikum salam. This is the issue about secularism. I mean, it's just a matter of semantics. Secularism, you said it yourself. The way the secularism is understood, okay? Very different ways. It's understood is that there's a separation between Allah, okay, and, you know, what happens in this world. That's what secularism is. So therefore, it totally conflicts with Islam. So, I mean, it's magical. So you can't really say that Islam accepts secularism, okay, because Islam has its own hukum, okay. Allah SWT has given us, like you said, you know, way of life, hukum for every aspect of our life. And that way it incorporates community, but it doesn't incorporate secularism. Brother asked the question that does secularism completely go against Islam, etc. I told very clearly in my talk, brother, if you heard my talk, I gave the definition of the Oxford Dictionary. And I gave other definitions, various. Everyone has his own definition of secularism. So I took the definition of Oxford Dictionary and proved to you that if secular means to do with worldly affairs, Islam is the most secular religion. I mean, my talk was very clear. I don't know where the confusion lies. But secularism does not tolerate Islam. Secularism says anything which is sacred, we don't have anything to do with it. We don't have anything to do with God. So we do we, Alhamdulillah, the other parts of secularism, we tolerate it. They don't tolerate Islam. Hope that it's a very clear cut statement that I made. Yes, sister. pose the question, what is the meaning of Islamic secularism? I mean, there are people who say that we are secular in world commerce, and I give certain example in my talk, that some people prove by saying that Islam is secular and say, Lakum dinukum deen. That means to use your way to me is mine. That means you can follow what you want, we can follow what we want. So that answer I gave in my talk, sister, saying that those who call those themselves secular in world commerce, they are pseudo, they are nothing like Islamic secularism. Islam is secular. But they try and twist the message to fit into the context of the non-Muslims. And they say, Islam says, La ikhra deen. There is no compulsion in religion. But they don't complete the quotation. The complete quotation says, there is no compulsion in religion, but truth stands out clear from error. So the moment you say there is no compulsion, I do agree, you cannot force anyone at the point of the sword, or at the point of the gun. But when you say that there is no compulsion, you should also say, truth stands out clear from error. When you say that to you is your way, to me is mine, before that you have to say that, oh, those who reject faith. The question of rejection only arises when you present the truth. So those who say Islamic secularism and they try and twist the words of the Holy Quran, they are not following the Holy Quran. If you follow the Quran as a whole, you, you can't just take out one verse of the Quran and throw it on his face and say this is Islam. You as, we as Muslims should follow the whole Quran and Islam itself is sufficient. You don't have to add anything to Islam to make it better. 
Allah SWT says in Surah Maidah chapter 5 verse number 3 On this day I have I perfected my religion for you and I have chosen for you Islam and I have completed my favor on you. This religion is complete, you can't add anything more and take it out. It's the perfect way of life. There are people who try and twist verses of the Quran and make it more acceptable to the people. This itself is the best way of life and it should be the most acceptable from the answer question. question regarding born again Christians, there is a new sect which has evolved in the Christendom. Born again, born again. They say that in the court from Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14 that his name was Emmanuel with us and that he was born again, born. Meaning that all these things that the Christian do, having alcohol, then having all vices, adultery, etc. These are done by the other Christian. We are pure Christian. We have been born again. We previously used to have drugs, we used to have alcohol, etc. Now we have been born again, we have been guided by the Holy Spirit. It's a new sect. They believe in the Bible, but they try and interpret that all the other Christians are not true Christians. We are the true Christians and we are the only group which is going to go to paradise. That's what they say. It's a new cult that has evolved. And, they are, and there are changes in various churches. For example, the Protestant church. The Protestant church says that a person can marry. Therefore, I made very clear in my talk, Catholic Church. The talk is very clear. The Catholic Church say that you should not marry to come closer to God. But the Protestants, they protested against the Church and said, we don't believe in so many laws of yours. One of them was marrying. Therefore, the movement is called Protestants. And again, we have born again, we have Seventh-day Adventists, we have Pentecostal, we have Jehovah's Witnesses. There are more than a thousand different denominations. Hope the answer is Yes, it's the most welcome. Inshallah. Yes, it's the most welcome, sister. Please understand that the microphone that you're using, you won't hear it over the PA system, but the question is being recorded when you say So please use the microphone. Wait till you ask the question. Permissible for any kind of like taking a child's picture, your child's picture, or you know, personal or commercially, any kind of photography, photography about photography. photography. Uh, if it's permissible for like if I take my child's picture or you know for you know keep, to keep or something like that. This is the question: Is photography permissible? Can I take my child's picture, etc.? So there is no text in the Holy Quran speaking about photography, etc. Yes, there are several hadith speaking about photography. What you should realize, the tasweer, the word tasweer comes from the word tasawwur, meaning to think. Anything which takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, away from Islam is haram. I mean, there are references of several hadith regarding photography. If you take a photograph of a person like a singer Michael Jackson or a famous film star and you put it in a drawing room, make it a blow up, it's leading towards shirk, it's leading towards idol worship, it is haram. Or any photography leading to things which are haram, like obscene photography, pornography, all these things are haram. But photography for remembrance of your parents, of your children, if you have in the in album, Alhamdulillah. But again, if you start loving your child so much and make up a blow up photograph of a child and put it in the drawing room, big size, that is too leading to shirk. But if you have photograph of your son, of your parents, and the album to remember, Alhamdulillah. Now we are having photography of mine. Like, they are, they are shooting me. But naturally, this lecture will be heard by people who are not present here. It will take them towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If it's for a good cause, it's perfectly fine. What the scholars say, that three-dimensional things is haram. Any three-dimensional thing, like you make an idol, that leads to shirk. 
So three dimensional photography, like making sculpture, etc. This is totally haram. This thing, if it's for a good cause, taking of towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's perfectly fine. But even if this two dimensional photography takes you away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, like shirk, etc., even that is haram. Hope that answers the question, sister. Does anyone have any questions? Those who have not asked the question, ask first. Please. Yes, brother. So the Nara is uh, the end of the phrase. In the Surah of Ibrahim, now we see the first of Surah Ibrahim. Because I asked the question that towards the end of Surah Allah, it does say Sohafa Ibrahim of Musa. What is the Surah Ibrahim? As I mentioned in the questionnaire session, that we know four revelation by name. Torah, Zabur, Injil and the Furqan. Torah is the revelation, Wahi given to Moses, peace be upon him. Zabur is the Wahi, the revelation given to David, peace be upon him. Injil is the Wahi, the revelation given to Jesus, peace be upon him. And Furqan, the Holy Quran, is the last and final revelation given to the last and final messenger prophet. Muhammad peace be upon him. Sahuf Ibrahim is again a revelation, but the name is not there. Sahuf means part, it's a small revelation. It is not a name of a revelation. It's a revelation given to Ibrahim alayhi salam. Name is not there. Therefore I said, by name we know four revelation. Torah, Zabur, Injil and Furqan. There were several other revelations which we don't know by name. One among them is Sahuf Ibrahim. That means even Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim peace be upon him got a revelation. The name we don't know. Like how the name of messengers we know 25 by name in the Holy Quran. But the hadith, the authentic hadith says there are 124,000 messengers, prophets set on the face of the earth. So Sahuf Ibrahim is again, it's a Sahuf, it's a part of the revelation. Hope that's the question. Yes, brother. I think my sister that's say. Yes, sister, most welcome. The... The concept of the masjid, what is the purpose of it, and how is it to be used for the furtherance of the development of the ummah? And also, the Juma Qutbah, I was told that during the time of Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, it used to be a time when the people were apprised of their situation and given instructions as to how, go about, how to go about their worldly affairs. And I also understand that at some time that practice stopped. Can you just enlighten us a bit as to when that practice stopped, why did it stop, and is it a good thing that we revive that, you know, to get direction for our daily lives? Sister, that's no question about Islamic history. And I do agree with that time of beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him. The masjid was the center. It should be a center, not only for a place of worship. As our beloved Prophet said in Sayyid Bukhari, Volume 1, Hadith number 429, that the whole world is a place for me and my followers to do sujda. Anywhere you do sujda, it's called a masjid. Where you do sujud, it's called a masjid. So masjid should be besides offering salah, but naturally it should be a center where people learn. And that was the time when, at the time of a prophet, there were people who came not only to pray in the mosque, they came to ask the prophet questions. And there's a full section in Sahih Bukhari, in which it says that the woman came to the prophet and said, that why don't you give us time where we can ask you questions, since you're covered, you're always surrounded by men. So in the mosque, they used to discuss about politics, they used to discuss about Islam, there used to be question on secession, but unfortunately now it's dying out. This is the question, can I tell exactly when did it die out? Sister, I'm not a scholar in Islamic history. My field is Dawa, Islam and compared religion. You ask me anything about the Quran, about the Bible, about the Gita, about the Veda, that's my field. If I say that I've heard somebody saying that so and so thing happened, it will be from hearsay. Quran says in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 59, ask the person who knows. So ask a historian who's expert in the field of Islamic history, he will do a better job. I'm not the fit person. I'm fit for Dawa. Ask me questions which non Muslim poses you, I'll be the right person, sister. Hope that's the question. Yes, brother. Walaikum as salam. Just like in Bangladesh and Pakistan. The brother asked the question that is a woman allowed to lead a nation like in Bangladesh and Pakistan? This is a very controversial question which people keep, keep on posing. There is no text in the Holy Quran saying that a woman cannot be the head of state. 
there's no text in the Holy Quran saying directly. But there are certain hadith which speak about that. There are two groups of scholars. One group of scholars say that women cannot be the head of state. The other group of scholars say women can be head of state. I will give you the views. That there is a group of scholars who says that since there's a hadith, which is authentic hadith, which says that that nation which is led by a woman will not prosper. So that group which says that women cannot be head of state, they say that see, this was only referring to that particular time which Persia was ruled by a queen. Not this, I mean, sorry, this hadith refers to those scholars who say that women can be head of state. They say that this hadith refers to only that particular time where Persia was ruled by the queen. It's not an eternity. Those who say no, women cannot be head of state, they say this hadith is still eternity. This is the opinion. What I want to ask is that let's reason out whether it's logical for a woman to be head of state or not. See, when you are head of state, it's preferable many a time the head of state should lead the salah. But naturally, if a woman is asked to lead salah, there are certain postures we have to do. Qayam ruku sujood. And if a woman is standing in front of a man, a man will concern more on her than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So but natural women can't even lead prayers in a mixed congregation. When congregation is only of women, she can lead. So when you become the head of state, there are ta- you have to solve the problem of common human beings. Common uh, subjects. And there is interaction. You have to meet the other head of states. Since today most of the other head of states are men. And if you want to talk about something private, in closed room. Islam does not allow that a man and woman can be in a closed room alone. The third person is the devil. So but naturally you can't interact with other head of states. You see, whether it be Pakistan, whether it be Benazir Bhutto or Bangladesh or Turkey, whatever it is, you see they expose in the media. They expose in the media. There's photography, etc. You see there's intermingling of sexes. How much they try? Just to come in power? You see the previous life of these presidents, what was it? Was it Islamic? All sorts of nonsense they used to do. But when they come, they wear the scarf and present themselves as two Muslims. If you analyze that there was a survey done in Canada by two scientists, they said that the nature of the female is more of verbal and vocal that's required for motherhood. The nature of a man is spatial. Spatial means thinking about the future, making decisions. So this, the nature of man is more fit to be the head of state than of that of a female. So this research was done by two female scientists, non-Muslim. In Canada. If you analyze that a woman, she may become pregnant. So who will look after the government for those few months? In Islam, a woman has been given a very high status because she's a mother. Now it's difficult for a woman to do the role of a mother and head of state. It's much more easier for a man to do the role of a father and head of state. The, and nowhere it is that you should be head of state, it's not a father. So if you ask me that a woman has to compromise her motherhood for becoming, becoming head of state, it's a very bad bargain. It's very bad. Because the respect and the sawab she gets, the blessing she gets for becoming a mother is far more superior than becoming head of state. Therefore, on my view, I feel it is not advisable, for my view, I support those scholars who say that women should not be head of state. But that does not mean a woman can't take part in politics. A woman has the right to vote. The Quran says in Surah Mumtahina, chapter number 60, verse number 10, that, O Prophet, verse number 10 and 12, that, O Prophet, when the woman come to E for the oath of fealty, that means the woman give us a bed. To a beloved prophet, not only electing him as a leader, the head of state, also as a spiritual leader. The voting system of Islam is far superior than the modern system of voting. They can take part in vote, and they can take part in politics. For example, the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, which a prophet agreed with. Most of the Sahaba said, our Iman went at the lowest. How could the prophet agree with such an unbiased treaty? All the negative points were for the Muslims. The Iman went at the lowest. It was the wife of the beloved Prophet, Muhammad peace be upon him, Umm Salma, may Allah be pleased with her, who supported the Prophet and guided the Prophet. Supported the Prophet, said what he did was right. So a woman can support, give decisions, and even if you know the incidents of a hadith, in which when Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, when they were deciding among the Sahabas that they should put an upper limit, 
they should put an upper limit for mahar. It was a common lady who objected from the back seat and said, when the Holy Quran is mentioned through Nisa chapter 4 verse 21, that when you can give a heap of gold, who is Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, to put an upper limit? And Hazrat Umar, may Allah be pleased with him, said, Umar is wrong and the lady is right. That means the woman took an objection to the breach of constitution. Quran is a constitution. So women can take part politics in such a way, but head of state, I feel it's more preferable that a man is. Hope that answers the question. I would uh, request that those who have not asked questions should ask first. As the rule is here, the same applies. If there's no question, then those who have not asked questions from the gents will ask first, so that we give equal opportunity to everyone. That those who have not asked questions get a first opportunity, then those who have asked one question will get a chance, then those who have asked two. In that way. Yes, brother. Make dua for non-Muslim. If it is allowed or not, what kind of dua is almost or not? And also about salam. My brother asked a question that can we make dua for non-Muslim and can we make salam for non-Muslim? I know that there are many scholars who say that you can't say salam. When they say salam, you should say alaikum. You cannot say full. <coughs> they fail to realize again. This is the opinion, go to the Quran. Don't quote Zakir said this and this Sheikh said that. Go to the Quran. The Quran says in Surah Nisa, chapter 4, verse number 86, it says, وَإِذَا حُيِّتُمْ بِتَحْيَتِمْ فَحَيُّ بِأَحَسَنَ مِنْهَا أَوْ رُدُّوهَا إِنَّ اللَّهَ قَانَ عَلَى قُلِّ شَيْنَ أَسِيبًا When a courtier's greeting is offered to you, wish it back with a greeting still more courteous or at least the same. Allah is careful in keeping of accounts. That means when anyone wishes you, whether Muslim or non-Muslim, you have to wish back more courteously. Someone says, Assalamu alaikum, you should say, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullah. Someone says, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, you should say, Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wish back more courteously. Or someone says, Assalamu alaikum, you say, Wa alaikum assalam. The words are same, but coming out from the depth of the heart. Even that's a courteous greeting. That's what the Quran says. So if a non-Muslim wishes you, Assalamu alaikum, you have to say minimum wa alaikum assalam according to the Holy Quran. I know there are hadiths in Sahih Muslim. I know that. Hadith volume number 3, which says wish alaikum. But out of context, the context is when the Jews used to wish the Muslims, assalamu alaikum. Assalamu alaikum means may death be on you. So then wish back alaikum to you the same. So you, you take out a hadith, see Quran, no hadith can go against the Quran. Number one, Quran is first, then come the Sahih Hadith. No Sahih Hadith will go against the Quran. There has to be certain context which are missing. So that quote, Sahih Muslim says, you cannot give. And you cannot neglect any verse of the Holy Quran. Therefore when Sheikhs differ in opinion, go to the Quran and your different opinion will be solved. Huh, unless the Quran does not mention and Hadith does not mention, then Alhamdulillah, then there can be differences. Then it's a fatwa. That when the Quran does not say, Hadith doesn't say, then according to your logic and your understanding, you start giving it can differ, then no problem. But when the Quran is clear on it, when the Hadith is clear on it, then there should be no difference, I feel. Now coming to your question, can we pray? Again, some Muslims say, you can't pray, because Quran says that Ibrahim alayhi salam, Ibrahim peace be upon him, was not asked to pray to his father. Again, I'm misquoting, putting out of context. What was they referring to after Ibrahim alayhi salam? father died, then you can't pray for him. Because Quran is clear cut in Surah Nisa chapter 4, verse number 64 and verse number 116, sorry, verse number 48 and verse number 116, that anyone who does shirk, Allah will never forgive his sin. If you die as a mushrik, you will go to Jahannam, there is no option for you. Any other sin, if Allah wishes, he may forgive you. So as a mushrik, if a person dies, you can't pray for him for sure. If a person dies as a mushrik, you can't pray. But if he's alive, can you pray for him? Yes. The Quran says in Surah Maryam, chapter 19, verse number 47, that when Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he was taken out from his house, when he was kicked out from his house, he said, Assalamu alaikum, may peace be on you. I will pray to my Lord to forgive you. Besides saying Assalamu alaikum to his father who was a mushrik, he says, I will pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive you. Again, which is the best form of salah, of dua? You get the answer in Surah Taha, chapter 20, verse number 47. When Aaron and Moses, peace be upon them, when they were asked to deliver the message, 
to fire on his people. He wished them by saying, May peace be on you, those who receive guidance. Peace be on those who receive guidance. And that was the greeting which our beloved Prophet used many a time when he wrote letters to the non-Muslim kings. He said, Peace be on you, those who receive guidance. Again, if you read in, in Surah Furqan, chapter 25, and Surah Qasas, chapter number 28, verse 66, Surah Furqan, chapter 25, verse 55 says that if the ignorant approach you, say Kalu Salama, say Salam to them. Quran says you can say Salam to them. Surah Qasas, chapter 28, verse 66 says, when you hear vain talk against Islam, tell them I am of not those who believe in the vain talk, Salam on you, peace be on you. So you can wish, you can wish salam to non-Muslim, you can do dua to them as long as they are alive. The best dua is, make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them hidayah. After they die, you can't, you can't do dua for them. Hope that answers the question. Yes, sir, most welcome. Um, a non-Muslim approached me and asked me, um, why do Muslims ignore Isaac and only talk of Ishmael? And he also asked me, or he told me that Muslims, that uh, uh, excuse me, Allah preferred Ishmael, excuse me, Allah preferred Isaac over Ishmael because Ishmael was the one chosen for sacrifice. So how can I explain to this non-Muslim that? The, the roles of Isaac and Ishmael. I should suppose the question that why do Muslims don't speak about Isaac, peace be upon him, and only speak about Ishmael salam, and why do they say that Ishmael salam was more superior to Isaac, peace be upon him? How will you answer them? Sister, we do believe even in Isaac, peace be upon him. We believe in both. Both were the sons of Abraham, peace be upon him. We believe in both. The Bible says also that both were sons, though they misquote the Bible also. Regarding your question, that Muslims say that Ishmael is preferred. The Holy Quran clearly mentioned in Surah Baqarah, chapter 2, verse number 253, that you are not allowed to differentiate between the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You have to respect them equally. We can't say one prophet is superior to the other. But Allah has given gifts to some, some He has not given gifts, stories of some He mentioned, the others He doesn't mention. So we as Muslims, we consider that all the prophets of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether it be Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Ishmael, Moses, David, Jesus, Muhammad, peace be upon them all, they all were prophets of God Almighty, they were all masoom, they were all sinless, and we have to respect all of them equally. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes one person superior to the other, that's his job. We as human beings, we can't differentiate between the prophets, we have to respect them equally. So if any Muslim is saying that Isaac, peace be upon him, is inferior to Ismail, peace be upon him, he is not following the Holy Quran. Hope that answers the question. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Please, please ask questions. Those who have not asked questions, give them a point. Be fair. It's very important to make these things easy like that. So just, uh, you know... Can I speak a bit louder, brother? I say it's sometimes important not to make them other Muslim. you got to be proud of what you are and to know what, uh, the history of the things. They are all equal, but there is a fact of is the history, which is the, the, the coming of Isaac, Iraq. It's after the reward from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the acceptance of uh, Sarah or you know to to, to uh, Hajara to be a f wife of uh, the Prophet uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Ismail for the fact is the first came before. Is what is the question brother? Everyone knows no, that I'm even I said Bible says that, Quran says that. No, I say, says that. I the say question is not who's first. I said Clearly I said that in the Bible. We don't have to make it easy like that. It is very easy. Quran says you cannot differentiate. 
So what's the problem? The problem, first question was, who came earlier? I said Ishmael alayhi salam came earlier. Who is superior? Both are equal. Both the questions answered. No, I was Why to complicate things? Okay, but Dr. Zak, he just want to confirm that we should be proud to confirm that Ishmael was the first. And I said that. To be proud, uh, that's nothing to be hiding now. We're supposed to be proud of that. I said that. Okay. Even okay. according to the Bible, Ishmael alayhi salam came that's first. Fine. That's even fine. Even according to the Quran. That's fine. But that does not make him superior. You don't have to hide, you know, it's okay. That way, Isaac alayhi salam came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Does that mean you superior to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa No. So when you use the argument, use your hikmah, otherwise they will trap you. Otherwise they say, Jesus Christ, peace be upon him, came before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa Does that mean he's superior? No. Hope that answers the question. Sorry. Yes, sister, most welcome. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum as Um, what is, um, okay, uh, about the... What? Fine. Come on, man. Okay. In Islam, what is it like about the abortion and birth control and um, artificial examination? Examination. Whatever. Insemination. So to ask the question, what about birth control and artificial insemination? When it comes to artificial insemination, you should realize there are two types of artificial insemination. One is homogeneous and one is heterogeneous. Homogeneous means the sperm and the ovum is taken from husband and wife. That's totally allowed. For so example, if husband and wife cannot give birth to a child due to some medical problem, and if you're taking sperm from the husband and the ovum from the, from the wife, and if there's artificial insemination, take the semen from the husband's side and implant it into the woman, the wife, it's totally allowed. But artificial heterogeneous insemination, Taking sperm from the sperm bank is totally haram. It's as good as adultery. So as long as whatever method you use, if the sperm and the ovum is of the husband and wife, it's allowed. If it's not of husband and wife, it's not allowed. That's the second part of the question. The first part of the question, birth control. People normally misunderstand the meaning of birth control and family planning. Birth control means a law taken out by a government that irrespective whether the citizen of that country or the state of law, whether he's rich or poor, he should follow the law of the government. For example, ek ke baad abhi nahi, do ke baad kabhi nahi. After one you should not have a child, after second you should not have at all. That is the policy they have in India. You know, if it's a fixed policy by the government, irrespective whether you're rich or poor, maximum two children, after that you can't give any more children, you can't give birth to any more children. That's called birth control, it's totally haram in Islam. What, you, what your main question I believe sister is family planning. Can we plan a family? And your, if you analyze, all the ulamas unanimously agree that permanent methods of family planning like vasectomy and pubectomy, it's haram in Islam. When it comes to abortion, the Quran says in Surah Anam, chapter 6, verse number 151, and Surah Nahal, chapter, <laughs> Surah Isra, chapter 17, verse number 31, that kill not your children for want of sustenance. For it is Allah that will give sustenance to you and your children. For killing of children is a major crime. So, but natural abortion is also haram in Islam. Now, I should realize that if abortion is done to save the life of the mother, then it is allowed. Even permanent method, if it is done to save the life of the mother, for example the doctor says that if you give birth to one more child, your life is in danger, or she's suffering from heart problem, and the labor pains may cause her a heart, if she has a heart problem, she may die, then it is allowed. And extreme cases to save the life of the mother, abortion is allowed, artificial, I mean, uh -huh. any permanent method, even that's allowed. But if there is no danger to a life, permanent methods, all ulama agree, agree unanimously, it is not allowed, even abortion is not allowed. The main controversy that arises is amongst the temporary method. I mean, there is a hadith in which one of the person asked the Prophet that I practice coitus interruptus. That means the sexual act is broken. I practice that. The Prophet was silent. So those who say that temporary method is not allowed say that, see, the Prophet was silent. That means he didn't agree with it. Those people who say temporary method is allowed, they say, see, the Prophet was silent. That means he gave permission. Now here again, in temporary method, there is a, let, a little bit of difference of opinion between the different schools of thoughts. Here should realize 
that the most common temporary method is copper tea that is used. People think copper tea is a contraception. Even when I was in a medical college, I was taught, I was taught that copper tea is a contraception. Actually, copper tea is not a contraception. What does the copper tea does? That the conception has already taken place. The ovum and the sperm has mixed to form the zygote. It prevents the implantation of the zygote on the womb of the mother. So it is not contraception, it is contra-implantation. That means a very, 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 very early abortion. So Quran says killing of children is a crime, so but natural even copper tea is not allowed. But my basic question is that why do you want to do family planning? That's my basic question. So people say that see because you know uh, that there's so much of population and there's so much of poverty. There's so much of poverty that you know that if you have more children you can't look after them. So Islam has a system of how to remove poverty. If poverty is a problem, remove poverty. Why or not? Why are you preventing people from coming in the world? Islam has a system of zakah. That every rich person who has a saving of more than the nisab level, 85 grams of gold, he should give 2.5% of that saving every lunar year in charity. So if you are poor, you have a right to accept zakat. Many Muslims think that accepting zakat is inferior. You become inferior if you accept zakat. It's your right, it's your haq. And when a rich person is giving zakat, he's not doing an obligation on you. He's not doing a favor on you. It's his duty to give zakat. So zakat, and if every rich person in the world gives zakat, poverty will be eradicated from this world. There will not be a single human being who will die of hunger. There will not be a single human being. Some people say, no, see, we are rich people, but uh, if we have many children every year, then we can't give equal attention to them. You know, we can't give proper attention. So Quran, when it speaks about killing of children, it speaks in two ways. One is Surah Anam chapter 6 verse 151 and Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 31. The first time it says that kill not the children for want of sustenance. For it is Allah that will give sustenance to you and your children. Which poor people say that we don't have enough money. If we have one more child, we won't be able to look after them and ourselves. So Allah says we give sustenance to you and your children. The next verse of Surah Isra chapter 17 verse 31 refers to rich people. Those who say that we will not die of hunger, but we can't give proper education to them. So Allah says, kill not the children for want of sustenance, for it is Allah that will give sustenance to your children and to you. First place says to you and your children. The second place says to, to your children and you. On the face of the... On the face of it, it looks similar, but there is a world of a difference. First verse is referring to very poor people. The second verse is referring to rich people. That Allah will look after your children and you. If my parents would have been family planning, I would not have been born. I would have been born. I would not have been here. I am the fifth child of my parents. Do you think I am a bane for society or boon for society? So the thing is that, if you think, What's your problem? Why are you family planning? Solve the problem. Kill the cause. And the Holy Quran says in Surah Al, Al Imran, chapter 3, verse number 54, it says, Makaru makar Allahu, wallahu khairul makreen. That they planned and plotted. Allah too planned. Allah is the best of planner. So if you feel that Allah is the best of planner, you want to leave it to Allah, leave it to Allah to plan your family. If you, if you feel you can plan it better than Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, ahlan wa sallam, the choice is yours. Hope that answers the question. <laughs> Um, is there any such good deeds that could be done in which the reward would be greater than any other good deed that you could do? And also, um, so can, I, can I do any good deed in which? Is there any such good deed that could be done in which the reward? Don't be give donation. Can, can you do any good deed? Yeah. Can you do any good deed in which the reward will be greater than any other good deed you can ever do? That's one. Okay. What is what is the best work you can ever do that you can get the greatest reward from Allah for that matter exactly? The best thing. This is the third part. And what I would like to say, I have more questions, but you know, only if you will allow me or wait for another Please time. Please put one question. Thank you, Shabda. So which deed that you can do, which is the best, your maximum sawab? The maximum. See, the Quran mentions about the sin which is the worst. 
and there are various good deeds Quran speaks about the sin which you avoid is shirk so if you are doing shirk and you stop doing shirk that is the biggest good deed you are doing shirk is the biggest sin which Allah will never forgive Quran says in Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 64 and Surah Nisa chapter 4 verse number 116 that he, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not forgive you associating partners with him any other sin if he wishes he will forgive but associating partners he will never forgive so shirk is the biggest crime in good deeds there are various good deeds so heel aspect is there respecting your parents is there being good to your children being good to your wife the various good deeds I mean I don't know myself which is the highest I don't know but, but naturally the sin which is the worst is shirk so you avoid from shirk that is the best deed I can say and believing in tawheed yes sister yes sister okay okay can I hold it? Okay. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, Brother Zakir, I want to ask you, uh, reading the hadith that you should not hoard anything, you shouldn't hoard wealth, gold, anything. In fact, uh, that you shouldn't plan more than three days because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala plans your life, right? But our parents give us a lot of gold in our wedding and you know, a woman tends to keep buying gold, right? So what happens is it is bought for ornamental use under the facade of investment. It's bought for ornamental use, but you keep uh, uh, pacifying yourself, saying that it is investment. And then you have so much gold in the bank, in the safe deposit vault, just sitting there. And I'm wondering, and then there's a hadith where they say that if you hoard gold, it will be put into your ears, melted and put in your ears on the day, day of judgment, or one of these things. Now I'm wondering whether that is permissible, or should we just keep how much we're using on a daily basis, a nominal amount, and just remove everything in the form of sadaqa or zakah. This still has a question that there are people who hold gold, etc. And the hadith we say that if you hold gold, it will melt and put into yours, etc. I do agree with the hadith, but normally as I said, I prefer, if there's a verse in the Quran talking about that, I quote the Quran. Because I believe in Sahih Hadith, not that I don't, I have to believe in Sahih Hadith. But if there's a verse in the Quran, because any different school of thought, they will say, okay, this hadith is Sahih, this is Sahih. I agree with what the hadith quoted is Sahih. I agree with that. But there's a verse in the Holy Quran in Surah Tawbah, chapter 9, verse number 34, which says that those who bury the gold and silver, those who bury the gold and silver, announce to them that on the day of judgment, the heat will be taken out from the hellfire, and this gold will be melted from it, and it will be embarked on their back, on their flanks and on the side and said have ye the taste of gold you hold it so Quran says if you hold gold those people who hold, give, hold gold and don't stand in the way of Allah in charity tell to them that from the hellfire heat will be taken out and from this gold you will be embarked, embossed on your back on your sides and on your flank and said taste the gold which you hold it so holding is haram regarding the question that in the form of marriage etc they give you ornaments can you keep them you should realize that ornaments is not wrong if a lady wears ornaments alhamdulillah but it should not be extravagant limited fine you should have i've got no objection if a lady feels like wearing ornaments i don't want to deprive it of her but people who in the guise of ornaments invest and i do know of that that they have several kilos and cages and cages of ornaments so is it a good investment? Is it right? What I say that if anyone wants to invest in any business, the answer is given in the Holy Quran. If any Muslim wants to invest in any business, refer to the Holy Quran, Surah Baqarah, chapter number 2, verse number 261. That's the master key for investment. It says that if anyone sows one grain in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you seven years, each year bearing a hundred grain. That means 700 times profit. 
Allah promises you that if you spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you 700 times profit. In business terminology, it is 70,000 percent profit. I want to know in which investment, in which business can you get 70,000 percent profit? Which business? But the criteria for investing in this business is taqwa. You should have taqwa in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You should have faith. We say we believe in the Quran. Wallah. Most of the Muslims don't. It's a shame on us. If we say we believe, if I tell you today that I have a certain secret business in which you will get hundred times profit, I'm sure of it. Everyone out here will give every penny of the saving in that business. If you know hundred times profit. Allah says seven hundred times. Seventy thousand percent profit. And Allah does not stop there. He said He will give you many fold. So I'm telling that it is to have the minimum required for you. What is required? People think, and there is a hadith that you can't give everything in charity so that your family comes on the street. You can't. You can't give everything that you become a pauper. You should lead little bit for your family also. But what is required? So I request that if you ask me for advice, are they doing the right thing? Little bit ornaments may require an emergency, little bit, fine. But whatever access they have, if they want to invest it, invest it in the way of Allah. And whenever you want to make dua, the wealth comes. And even if you don't get here, inshallah in the year after you'll get. Because if you're a good businessman, a businessman does not mind having a loss in the initial stage. This life that you're leading sister is how much? Average 60 years. Some live for 20 years, some live for 90 years. Average take it 60 years. If you have to undergo turmoil etc. in this world, in exchange for paradise, it's a very good bargain. But Allah says He gives you wealth as a test for the year after. He's giving you wealth, testing you. So if you spend in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you may undergo hardship here, but in the year after you'll get Jannah. So, and those who hold gold, they will be branded with that gold on the day of judgment. The choice is theirs. Do they want Jannah or do they want to be branded with the gold which they hold? Hope that's the question. Assalamu alaikum. We have two questions, one from the brothers and then one from the sister and then Jazakumullah khair because it's time for Asia. Go ahead please. Uh, a couple of my friends work in places where they either have to sell alcohol or serve alcohol. What does the Quran and the Sunnah say about that? As well as, can you elaborate on that question? Brother posed the question that there are some of his friends, maybe Muslim friends, who work in a place where they serve alcohol. What does the Quran and the Sunnah say? The Quran says in Surah Maida, which I mentioned earlier, chapter 5, verse number 90, Ya ayyuhal ladhina amanu, O you who believe, inna mal khamru al maithuru, most certainly intoxicants and gambling, wal anzabu al aslamu, dedication of stones, divination of arrows, rishtum min amal shaitan, these are certain handiwork, fashtanimu la lukum tuflihun, abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. So the alcohol is the Satan's handiwork. And the next verse says that the Satan tries to misguide the people by using alcohol and brings enmity between the people. So the alcohol is a Satan's handiwork, abstain from it. Some people say that buying alcohol, I mean drinking alcohol is haram. Selling alcohol is allowed. We are going to Atlanta and Houston. I was shocked that Muslims sell alcohol, sell pork, sell lottery tickets. Saying, where does the Quran say it is haram? I say, Quran says, Rishum min amali shaitan. These are Satan's handiwork. Abstain from such handiwork that you may prosper. Abstain from anything to do with it. So you know, we Muslims are very intelligent. We use the Quran to suit our living. Muslims selling alcohol. Leave aside working, they sell alcohol. They sell pork. And they sell lottery ticket. Saying, we don't buy it. Means if it's bad for us, other person going to hell, let him go to hell. If you are his way of going to hell, even you will go to hell. Regarding the hadith, what does the Quran say about alcohol regarding hadith? There's a hadith in which our beloved Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, said, that Allah's curse is on those people, and he gives ten categories, of those people who distill alcohol, those who purchase alcohol, those who purchase it for somebody else, those who serve alcohol, those who sell alcohol, those who make a profit of, from alcohol, all these people Allah's curse is on you. So but natural, those people who are working in areas which are selling alcohol, if they themselves are serving alcohol, it's totally haram. 
but there are situations. For example, if you're working maybe in a company in which boss has alcohol or they serve alcohol to the guest, but you are not the person serving, then you don't fall in that category. And you should realize the business being done by that company, if it is serving alcohol at a major expense, for example, if you say that can I work for an airline? I'm just trying to give an answer in a much broader way. Can I work for an airline? Because most of the airlines have alcohol. You can see that kid said that you can't work in a company serving alcohol. See, in the airline business, if you're a hostess who serves alcohol, then it's haram. But if you're a ground hostess who does not serve alcohol, since alcohol is not the major profit of the airline, it's a minute percentage. The major profit is buying tickets and selling tickets. Alcohol is a minute percentage. Then the Sharia law says that if the major income of that company is halal and a minute negligible portion is haram, think that the salary of your income is from the halal income. So if you're a ground hostess, though the airlines serve the alcohol, you yourself should not serve it. But you are employed by the company which serves the alcohol. The income of that alcohol is minute percentage. So Islamic Sharia says you can work for that airline. But naturally you can't work for a bar in which they sell alcohol because they're serving alcohol. And the major income of that bar is from selling alcohol. It's haram. They have to change the job as soon as possible. Hope that answers the question. Inshallah, I think as the chairperson said, the last question will be from the lady's side, from the sister's side, and then we'll have the Salah of Isha. Isha Salah. This is the most welcome. We propose uh, to you, Dr. Naik. And that is, uh, can you speak whether or not uh, Muslims uh, should in the American political process in this instance or in any other processes that are not headed by Muslims? Sister, again, I'll ask a question on politics, that can a Muslim take part in American politics? Sister, I'm an Indian. I don't know what's happening in American politics. I'm not alone. You have to ask an American Muslim politician. Secondly, I'm not a politician. Muslims should take part in politics, yes, as a general rule. America, I don't know. As a general rule, the Quran says that women, as I said earlier, took part in voting. So Muslims should take part in voting. Should they take part in American politics? I'm not aware of the American politics. I don't even know the parties. Only I know who the president is. That's all. I'm not aware. We have to ask a Muslim politician. Politics is part of Islam. There is a field of politics in Islam. But then you have to ask a politician. He'll be an expert in that field. I'm not. And neither do I know the situation of America, so I cannot comment. Hope that's the question. Wa akhru da'wan alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. This is this whole the meeting. And we thank very much Dr. Zakir for his enlightening lecture and for his intelligent and good answer for many questions. And if we keep receiving questions as such and answers as such, we will keep staying here until morning. So we have to give him a break because he spent a long time traveling from one place to another and when he came, he came very early and he spent all this time about four hours talking so he needs rest. Inshallah, let us pray that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala may bless him, may reward him for his effort and may make him very successful in his own lecture everywhere. I think you still have some other meetings. Thank you very much. May Allah bless you.